you can measure them on performance. Like, you know, maybe in the beginning, you just need to start tracking performance and not have any judgment about like, is it good or bad? Or are they meeting a goal, but start tracking it. But after a while, you're like, okay, this is our normal, this is our average, when we start bringing that up. So now they have a goal, and you can track that. Are they are they creating posts that are increasing your followers or that are getting more reactions? And, you know, that's a sign of doing good work. So I do still think their work is measurable. I mean, also basic things like meeting their deadlines. Hello, Profit First entrepreneurs and thought leaders. I am so excited. We have a very special guest. Her name is Kristen Harris. She's the COO and co-creator of a company called Portfolio Creative, which is a staffing company that specializes in staffing and recruiting for companies in terms of providing digital marketing and creative teams. So they're building creative teams and she's going to help with the recruiting of that. Now, Portfolio Creative is an award-winning woman-owned business, and it was really built to connect creative talent with companies that really need their talents and skills. Now, Christian is also a creative herself. She spent four years in art school, 13 years as a designer, art director, and creative manager for corporate marketing departments. And she's got an eye for talent and passion that she can find in people that are really wanting to bring their creative ideas to the market. So please join me in welcoming Christian to our platform. Today, we've got lots of juicy discussions about small business and really the advantages that small businesses have in their recruiting, as well as hiring for recruiters, hiring for people that you know you need to be able to absorb their ideas and use their ideas in your business. So, so excited to have Christian join us. Please join me and welcome Christian to the platform. Hey, Christian, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here. You know, and I hear it so much, you know, when it comes to hiring, everybody is like feeling intimidated when they're going against the, I'm going to call them the big guns, you know, out there, those Fortune 500. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, other than that wonderful mom and pop culture, it's hard to see what the incentive it is to come work for us small businesses. So Christian, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about what are some of the advantages uh, working for a small company and how do we attract talent in this particular economy? Yeah. And it, it's crazy out there. I mean, anybody who has been trying to hire, I'm sure is experiencing that. So I think when you can figure out, you know, what unique advantages maybe you have, what you can offer that's different, that helps you, you know, maybe attract that talent away from the big guys, right? Or in uh, as an alternative. So I think there are a few things like the first thing that comes to mind for me. And so we're a small business, first of all. So this is my experience, you know, hiring for our own team. I'm the COO. So I'm more on the operational side and I oversee a lot of the recruiting with our own team and for our clients. So we're a small company. We work with large and small companies. We work with really huge corporations and, you know, very small companies, maybe similar in size to our own. So you know, we've seen all the sides, right? And I think that the first thing that comes to mind really is the flexibility that a smaller company has in creating opportunities that fit for someone. And so I think that when you're a really large corporation, you have to kind of be consistent about how you handle things. And especially, I think COVID, this whole, you know, last two years, or we're going into three years now, I think, <laughs> um, has brought that to light in a lot of ways where, a larger corporation, you know, just to kind of get their arms around what's going on has to have some set of rules and processes around, you know, working from home, testing, whatever, you know, a whole variety of things where a smaller company isn't dealing with 10,000 employees, right? They're maybe dealing with 10 or 50. And so they can think a little bit more about, you know, what will fit our population and of course, suit our business. Like at the end of the day, you're a business. You have to get your work done. <laughs> you have to keep your business running. <laughs> like, you know, reality check. We have to all think about our business first. But if we can think about where our employees are coming from and provide some flexibility or you know, listen to what they're looking for, it can help make your company really attractive. And so examples Remote work is obviously a huge one. I'm sure everyone's thinking about it. Some people really are liking it. Some people are craving going back into an office, to be honest. Like some people do not have a great space to work in or don't like being by themselves all the time. Like there's lots of, of reasons. And same with companies. Some companies love remote. Some really, really want to see their employees every day. But I think if you can find some flexibility, whatever your policy is, 
that can help attract people that maybe are in an environment that is frankly being very hardcore, maybe about returning to the office and they're loving remote work. If you can offer remote or you can offer a hybrid situation, that's going to be attractive to someone. And there's other things around like schedule, more flexible schedule. Maybe you're comfortable with people who want to work part-time hours or a 30-hour schedule, or everyone is available between 10 and 2. But if you want to start at 6 a.m. or you want to start at 10 and work later, you know, like we offer some flexibility around that. And I think all of those things just gets more complicated to manage stuff like that when you're a really big company. But when you're a smaller company, I think you can tailor things to even an individual to suit their needs as long as it's seen. I think the biggest thing is as long as it's seen as fair by your team. Does that make sense? Like everyone has to feel that they had an opportunity have, to have some flexibility for themselves too. Maybe they didn't want the same flexibility, but they need to feel like if they needed something that would be at least up for conversation as well. Absolutely. You know, just having that fairness that if someone's circumstance change that that opportunity will be available to them is extremely important to not have yeah. coworkers with special treatment, right? Yes, exactly. I think that sometimes I think that's the concern. It's like, oh, well, if we start, you know, having all these special accommodations for people, how will we ever manage it or pull it back in or whatever? I think people have a lot of worries about maybe it spinning out of control in some way. But my experience has been that people generally do not take advantage of those things. Like they ask for the thing that they really need or that's really important to them. They don't tend to ask for 10 things. You know, <laughs> it's like, I really want to pick up my kids when they get off the school bus. So can I start work very early and be done at three o'clock? End of request. You know, it's not like, and also these seven things. <laughs> Here's my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and some people have a wish list, but even when working with candidates, we ask them to prioritize that wish list. Like, okay, you have a lot of things you would like to find, but what is most important to you? And usually there's a few things that really, really matter. You know, it may be location, it may be flexibility, it may be pay. You know, like at the end of the day, I want to meet my goal for what I want to make and I will give up all the other stuff. I'll show up the office five days a week if they will pay me my salary. So, you know, everybody has their most important items and we try to just get down to what those are. When you're interviewing someone, figuring that out is important too. And how do you know when you're interviewing someone what's important? Do you ask or tell me about what that process is to get down to that? Yeah, I think it's important to ask to have those conversations. Obviously, when you're having an initial interview, you're talking about the role and their skill set and, you know, does it seem like a fit for them and those sort of things. But I think it's good to just, you know, open up up front where you are with things that you think they may care about. <laughs> and that also opens the door with for them to ask for something that may be really important to them. I think that candidates in an interview, I mean, not everyone, but like pe people are a little nervous, maybe slightly intimidated. They're probably not going to just come out with it if you don't open the door, but they're probably thinking about it. So, you know, like for us, we may say, hey, you know, just up front, we will let you know we are fully remote. We do have a shared office space. If you don't want to work from home, we can get a desk for you, or you can go there when you want. Here's our work schedule. This is our expectations. Like, does that sound like an environment that's going to work for you? And have you done that before? And it doesn't matter if they haven't, but I do want to know, have you worked remotely or is this going to be a whole new world for you? <laughs> you know? And I think by laying out like, here's our situation, it also allows them to say, oh, I'm so glad you said that because here's what I think, you know, I need. Here's I don't want to work remotely. I'm so glad you said I also could get a desk if I need or, you know, whatever their concern may be too. Do you find that candidates are pretty honest about the things that they want, what's important to them? I think if you get them talking, it will come out. <laughs> uh, but I think that it is a conversation where people tend to come in a little buttoned up and, you know, close to the vest and sometimes a little nervous or just, you know, slightly guarded. But if you can build some rapport and get them talking about their work, their background, their interests, like what they really care about, and get them to open up a little bit and build a bit of trust, I think that they will share with you. But like I said, I think it helps for you to share first. If you go first, then um, often they'll be like, well, you know, since you mentioned that. <laughs> and that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, I always wonder, you know, 
with a candidate. I'm like, how do I get to the root of it? You know, asking, but then I'm also at the same time, very surprised how candid and honest they are too, um, Mm -hmm. with telling you, you people will ask you before they even get the job or an offer or even interest, like how much is this position paying? You know, (laughs) your first question these days. Yeah. That is not our recommended first question for someone to ask. I mean, it's important, but I always think like, but there's other things that are probably more important too. So (laughs) we coach people and not lead with that one, but it's important. They probably need to know. I think that, like I say, if you could build some rapport, and I do think especially in this environment, I mean, it is a candidate market, right? Like people people who have a strong skill set, maybe an in-demand role, like they know they have options. And so they're looking for the best fit for them too. And so I find that maybe people are a little more upfront about what they're looking for because they're kind of shopping you as well, right? And they always are and probably always should be like you want to be a good match on both sides. But I think especially now if they have something that's really important to them, it will probably come up because they're looking for that. Another way is sometimes to ask them why they're looking or why they're interested in leaving their company, it might come out then, you know, oh, well, now that you asked, you know, my company has announced that they're going fully on site in two months, and I just don't want to do that. Or, you know, that's not going to work with my family schedule or whatever. Like, sometimes the reason for leaving somewhere might lead to something that obviously is a pain point for them. Definitely. So what are the other advantages that we have as small business owners to attract candidates over the large ones, the large companies? (laughs) The the large ones. I think another one is the mission and the passion that small businesses tend to have. You know, I think every company started with a a little inkling in of idea or a, a passion for something or a way to do something better, invent the better soap or car or whatever. But as larger companies evolve, I think large companies care about what they're doing too. But it is sometimes harder for employees to feel really closely connected to what that original passion and mission is. And I think when you're working in a small business in the same environment or on calls or in meetings or whatever with a founder and the original people that started it, a leadership team that's really invested, it shows up more deeply and quickly, I think. You know, if you're not driven by Wall Street, which a lot of large companies are, and you're more driven by something that is a mission, and we're all still trying to make money here, like (laughs) profit first, right? But usually founder-led companies were started with some sort of a passion, and that's still there, especially if that original founder is still there or the original, you know, people that started the business or spun off that division or whatever. So I just think people see it more quickly and can attach to it a little bit more deeply. So that's another thing I really think people are looking for right now is something that aligns with what they care about, or at least isn't something they don't care about, (laughs) if that makes sense. So I think in, you know, you go through two years of a variety of crises and Some people have started to ask themselves, like, why do I do this job every day that I don't really care about? I'm going to go find something else or somewhere else. Maybe I like the work I do, but it's not at this place. Or I don't care about this product that I sell. I want to go work for a company and sell something I do care about. But I think people have even more so in the past few years asked themselves some of those kind of questions. And so they are definitely looking at the company and what it does and what it stands for a little bit more. And I think sometimes they just can see it that faster with a small company. Definitely, definitely. You know, it's important to make sure that when you live, you know, every day counts, right? That you're doing something that you love and you're on board with the mission with that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you uh, spend so much time at work, right? And your brain power and energy that goes into the work that you do. Yeah. And I guess I'll say this too. I do think it's generational also. Younger generations. Oh, what am I? I'm an X and the Ys and the Zs. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of studies showing like they just care about mission, values, culture, all of those things, maybe more deeply than um, especially like the baby boomer generation. I think I'm a little in the middle. You know, we're kind of a little bit of, of both. We care, but we still were raised by the older generation. And so I think those younger generations, if you're hiring people in those age groups, which pretty much everyone is now, that's something that they're looking for, something that they can connect with. They, you know, sort of have been raised in a way to care about causes. And it doesn't have to be nonprofit type cause or that sort of thing. Like they could care about like building a great product or creating a new technology or, you know, all kinds of things they may care about, 
But I think they've been raised to believe they should be doing something they care about. Like you said, your life is just zips by, like you want to spend it doing something you care about. And I think those generations have been raised to believe that's something they ought to look for in their work. Which is why it's important as a founder, which a lot of us are as small business owners, that we really speak to the why, right? Like who we're helping, why we're helping them and why this is so important right now that we're doing what we're doing, right? And you said speak to it. And I think that's it, like sharing it. You know, a lot of founders have that, but maybe they don't talk about it or share it that much or it's not on their website. You know what I mean? Like really putting that out there because it matters. It matters to you. And it's deep inside you, but sharing it beyond yourself so that other people are seeing it too. Exactly. Exactly. Now, are there any other advantages that we have as small businesses besides the flexibility, being able to meet our employees' needs quicker, right? And probably more deeply in many cases, as well as um, just being able to be more mission-driven. Is there any other advantages that we have as a small business owner? One thing I was just thinking about a little bit, and it's tied to the flexibility, but there's definitely again, heightened by the past few years, but I think it's been there for a while. Um, More of a people really looking hard at their, I hate the term work-life balance because it's just never true or going to happen. But there, I think it's integration, how their work and their life integrate. And again, when you're working with and looking to hire younger generations, this is very important to them. I mean, they just believe, and I think it's true, I think they're right, that their life and their work can be integrated and they don't expect that it can't. (laughs) And so again, like that's a little bit of that flexibility being able to offer them. um, Maybe they like to volunteer somewhere once a month. If you can give them that day to do that, that would be really meaningful to them. You know, like it's important to them to be able to fit in the things that are important to them in their life because their work isn't their whole life. And they never expect it to like fulfill every need for them. And so being able to, I mean, it does come back to some of the flexibility we're talking about before, but being able to recognize that and offer a way for them to integrate all parts of them and fully be seen as all parts of them, like at work too, it's really important to them. Definitely, definitely. And not just the young people, us old people too, you know. Everyone. I mean, <laughs> I need to integrate my life every day. <laughs> so Kristen, you work primarily with we're creatives and you recruit for creatives and help place creatives with companies that are looking for that creative talent. Tell us, first of all, how do creatives differ from your traditional, typical employees? Like what makes them different and how do we attract them to be more attractive to creatives? Oh, how are we different? We're magical unicorns. That's all you need to know. (laughs) Um, I do think that creative people are different in not in a work ethic type of way, or anything like that. We're hard workers, we care about our work, we meet our deadlines, do what we need to do, understand the business purpose of doing something like I think that there can be a, you know, sort of a stereotype of like these or flaky artist just floating around and daydreaming out the window. But like if someone is working in a creative position within a company, like they understand they have a business purpose to the work they do and to their role. However, I think something that creative people really need is some space. And I think that you're seeing this in a lot of roles, honestly. Like I think of creative more, you know, the kind of roles we work with are more within marketing, advertising kind of positions, designers, writers, people doing UX, people doing social media, PR, project management within those creative departments, like a lot of different roles. It's within that creative world. But things like writing software code is also really creative. Like there's a lot of technology kind of positions and and many other kind of roles. Honestly, I think what you do is there's a creativity to it. And so I think so much of the work we do now is very cerebral. Like people need space to just think. It's like if you hand me a problem of something I need to solve. And whether it's a graphic design problem, like I need to create a logo, or it's a, our two software systems aren't connecting, we need to figure out, you know, what's going on, like whatever, like, I need a little space just to let my brain marinate on that. And so I think working with creative people, but I would say a lot of people fit in that bucket, this, you know, knowledge workers at this point, right, which is a lot of roles, providing space, not back to back meetings, not, um, checking with me every five minutes on what you have gotten done, you know, like sometimes let somebody go to a coffee shop and just doodle 
brainstorm ideas, you know, um, I think that giving people space and trusting them to manage their work and their time can be huge. You know, that's more on the side of working with creative people. And like I said, I think a lot of roles fall into that bucket now. Like you probably need time and space to go to a coffee shop and brainstorm solutions to things too. And you've fully stated you're more of like a math science number sort of person. You still have lots of problem solving going on in your brain, right? That has to get itself out. As far as hiring creative people, it can be difficult because I think it feels very squishy to people. It's like, how do I know they're good? Like, why do I even ask them? What am I looking for? <laughs> you know, like, they're kind of weird and mysterious. I mean, first of all, you're going to focus on core things that you would with any other potential candidate. Look at their resume. Do they seem to have a decent work history? You know, all those kind of things you're looking for. Um, but you're almost always going to be looking for portfolio, work samples, something of that type. And it depends on the role for sure on what type of thing they're going to show you. But most of these roles, I'm trying to think if there's really any of this wouldn't be true for, there's probably a physical manifestation of what they do. Like they're people that make things, right? So whether you're writing copy or doing graphic design or designing a website or managing a project or making a mean spreadsheet to manage all the projects, like they're makers. So they should have something to show you. They should have examples of their work come in different shapes and sizes. <laughs> but, you know, they should have examples of their work. And a lot of times you're looking for style too. Like, does this person's style just fit and resonate with your company and your brand? There's lots of great say graphic design, there's lots of great designers, but some have a very you know loose, illustrative style. Some love using typography, some use a lot of photography, some are very graphic and hard edge. All of those are great, but they're not all going to fit with what you have in mind and what sort of the style and flavor of your company and your brand is. So, you know, you're looking at their work samples. I mean, you may have judgment if you think they're good or bad or not, but not only like do you think they're good or bad, but just do they fit? Do they feel like you? Like, do you look at that and you're like, ooh, that feels like us. Or I think you could make things that feel like us. I always love to get people to start talking about their past work, their past projects, like their resume, especially for creative people. I don't think their resume tells you a whole lot other than maybe, you know, length of experience. And do they have some management experience if that's important, that kind of thing getting them to talk about the kind of work they've done, the kind of projects, like how large of projects, how big of budgets did they, you know, work with a team? Were they collaborating or were they doing everything themselves? Like all of that's really important to make sure it's going to fit with whatever you're looking for. If you're a very small company and you need a marketing person and they need to be able to do everything, take some photos and do your social media and keep up your website and write some copy and everything, then you need somebody who has been able to like, do all those facets of a project, obviously a larger, you know, maybe marketing department or creative department, they have to be able to really collaborate with all those other people because everyone has their role and the wrong match either way is, you know, not going to be a good fit. Definitely. I know like when we hire people that are more on the creative side, whether it's writing or doing some type of art. I know one of the first things we ask is, you know, send us some examples, you know, send us some examples of some work that you've done. You know, we've even done tests like, you know, this is what our brand looks like. These are our colors. Can you create a post or something that looks like it would be part of ours to see what their style would be and how their take would be. We even are testing turnaround, you know, like how fast does it get turned around when it comes back when we give them that project, because that's an indicator of what it's going to be like to work with them long-term. Do I need a month to go mm, about the project or can I get this done in a day? You know, so that's yeah. one of the things that we look at. So I really appreciate you saying that, Christian, from that standpoint. Now, I think one of the hard things about creative is, you know, like you said, everybody has a different style. There's sometimes people need to think more about things and, you know, some people that are quicker and sometimes that performance is a little bit harder to measure, I feel like, with creatives. Can you give us some tips on managing performance with creatives? Yeah, and I think you can find out sort of how someone operates from doing, you know, talking to some references. And I think this is another thing that's kind of an advantage with a small business is often we have a pretty good network. And so if you 
are hiring someone within your, you know, maybe region or your industry, a lot of times it's a pretty good chance you know someone who's connected or someone who's connected someone who knows that person or has worked with them or is connected with them. So I always, of course, follow up on the references they provide, but I try to find out, like, do I know anybody who actually just knows this person? And again, some of the things that you said, it's fine if they're fast, it's fine if they need a little bit more time. But one of those is probably going to fit with your team and one isn't. So finding out those kind of things can be really helpful, you know, trying to find someone to talk to about that, asking them to, but I think it's hard for people to judge that for themselves, or they always feel like there's a right answer. <laughs> like, oh, yes, I'm very fast. They always think that's the right answer. It's like, no, it doesn't have to be the answer. But you know, I mean, it's a little hard for people to be objective. Um, I agree. Like you said, in managing crave people, again, it can seem like very squishy, like where are they doing over there? And how do I know if they're doing a good job, but how do I measure their performance? I think it's like any other role, especially with when it's a creative role within a company. I mean, this is different if they're a fine artist, you know, creating their own work and selling through a gallery or something, right? But like, we're assuming they're a, a business function kind of creative role, a designer for your team or a marketing person or somebody running your social media or whatever. I still think just like any other position on your team, they have you know, job responsibilities, they have goals for every day, week, whatever your level of measurement is. I mean, they have things that can be measured. If you need seven social media posts done every week, they either got seven done or they didn't, you know, and then you can measure them on performance. Like, you know, maybe in the beginning, you just need to start tracking performance and not have any judgment about like, is it good or bad? Or are they meeting a goal, but start tracking it. But after a while, you're like, okay, this is our normal, this is our average. We would start bringing that up. So now they have a goal and you can track that. Are they are they creating posts that are increasing your followers or that are getting more reactions? And, you know, that's a sign of doing good work. So I do still think their work is measurable. I mean, also basic things like meeting their deadlines. <laughs> like I, um, I worked in a retail marketing department for many years before we started the business and retail was a very fast turnaround. And so obviously we want to do great work all the time. Like no one doesn't. And sometimes there are days when it's just, you know, good enough is good enough because being done matters more. Like it's good. It doesn't have to be amazing because we also need to get it out the door at five o'clock. And so you know, meeting deadlines is super important. It doesn't matter how great it is if you miss your deadline. If you have an event and you don't have your materials, it doesn't matter how fabulous they would have been, you know. So I think I honestly believe a lot of the same measures you may use for any other role apply. You may just have to think a little bit more like, how do they apply? Does that make sense? Definitely. So it sounds like it's a combination of mentoring and figuring out, like you said, what's the SLA, what's the service level that we're expecting this turnaround to look like? And you just kind of get that over time, really, with that. I think when you are hiring for that role, it's really important to be um, very upfront about what those expectations are. Like if you are outlining the role, and if you know in your heart, you want seven social media posts a day, maybe not in the job description you're going to post like out <laughs> on your website or whatever. But when you're having a, an interview conversation, like we, t I guess I should clarify, like we tend to have job descriptions we post, which have plenty of detail, lots of information, but maybe not every like single line because, you know, people can only stand to read so much. So enough information for someone to determine, would this be a good fit for me? And am I interested in finding out more? If they're interested in finding out more, we might actually have even more information we could share with them. Like here are the, like you said, the SLAs or something like that. So when you're putting together this role, Think about what those are for you. Like, what do you really want this person to accomplish? And I would lay it out up front in an interview. Like, you know, here's the role. Here's what I think it entails. Ultimately, this is my goal. I think that's something also to keep in mind. Like a lot of times, just like we said before, like these roles are makers. So at the end of the day, what you care about the most is the thing got made and it was really good. And so sometimes just saying to them, like, what this role really is for me is that these you know, five things happen every week for marketing for my company. And I have an idea of how I think I want them to be done and how to get there. But ultimately, you're the expert, like I'm also looking to you, how do you think we get them done? But that's really what this job is to accomplish these five things every week. And then we can figure out how what the best way is. Um, and then you absolutely have a measurable, you know, each of those five things are, are measurable, they're getting done, are they 
successful? Like, are they getting the reaction, the feedback you expect? I mean, most creative with a company is some sort of a marketing or sales connected work. Well, not always, I guess. Sometimes it's also the actual design of the product, you know, what you sell. (laughs) They might be designing that. But all of those things are measurable, like either they're designing things people want to buy, or they're building a website that people stay on longer and can navigate around and find what they want, or they're creating marketing tools, they're bringing leads for your sales team, like all of those have outcomes, like they they have things they need to make, which you can measure, and then the outcomes of how successful they are, you can measure too. No, I love it. I I definitely love it. I'm curious, Kristen, when it comes to hiring creatives, where does it go wrong with hiring (laughs) creatives? There's so many ways. I'm trying to think about like some of the main faux pas that we see. Um, I mean, one one thing that I think, especially in hiring creatives, often is, I want to say this in a way that's not disparaging, but it's like, oh, I have a nephew who knows how to like do stuff on the Mac, I'll just have him do this project. And sometimes that's great. Sometimes your nephew is extremely talented, or sometimes what you need is very simple. But like, if you want to rebuild your whole website, like just kind of think about what the endeavor is you have in mind. (laughs) Sometimes that's not the best route. And I think sometimes that happens because it's kind of a trust factor. It's like, oh, I know someone who knows someone. Um, But ultimately, you, you need probably a professional who can really handle the project you need. So I think that's one path I see, especially small businesses. They end up spending a lot of time and then they're like, well, great. I waste all this time. I still have what I need done. So just being realistic about what you actually need and what level of person you might need to to do that and what the investment might be to get that done. Another thing that we're seeing a lot right now, which I think is kind of interesting given the candidate market is really extended hiring processes. Like I am all for a thorough hire process. And for our team, we do a few different interviews. We do some assessments, like we're pretty thorough, I think, but we try to keep it moving really quickly and it's okay to have multiple steps, but I would ask like, what is the purpose of every step and do you need it? Or can you merge some? Or could you have like two people in the interview together instead of you know, seven interviews? Can you get it up to like three by grouping people or something like that? And also, even if you're gonna, going to have multiple steps, let the person know up front. I think most people are okay with whatever your process is if they know what's coming. When we see candidates get frustrated is when it's just like dragging on and on. It's like, oh, and another thing. Oh, and another thing, another thing. You know, they're like, oh my gosh, when will this end? I like, I'm so interested, but this is a lot. So you, you can't just say do that front, nowadays. No, absolutely not. If you say up front, like, hey, here's our process. We do these three interviews. We're going to do assessment. You know, everything going in. I, I think that's fair. Um, and then the other thing, just like you said, like the time, you know, you're spending all of this time. And what especially I think is an Achilles heel for people is you have all these steps in your hiring process and like, they must meet with X person and that person's on vacation. It gets drug out. And it's like, by the time you get through all that, like the person already found another job. If they're looking, they're probably looking. And if they're skilled, they're probably getting offers. So (laughs) tightening up your process as much as you can while still feeling good that you have enough assessment to make sure it's the right person for your team. Like there's a balance there and, you know, don't rush through it, but you know, how tight can you make it? and keep it moving and keep them informed. Like if you say, hey, we have one more interview and it's going to be next week, just wanted to let you know, you know, so-and-so's on vacation, we're getting it scheduled, get it on their calendar. They're probably not going to take another job or at least not contact you first if there's an interview saying on their calendar. But if it's like, oh, I'll get back to you. Yeah, by the time you do, they may have just, you know, moved on. So really keeping people informed about the process up front and as you you move along, like keep them engaged. I guess that's part of it is like, don't let them lose interest or drift away from you. Stay in touch. Keep them engaged. If you're really interested in them, tell them, hey, we're still really interested in you. Here's the next step. This is what I'm trying to get, you know, arranged. And you check with them too. Like if they are still interested, they'll stay in with you. If they're not, if they're not responding, they've kind of given you their answer, unfortunately. I absolutely agree. So Christian, as we wrap up our time together, one of the things that I like to ask our guests is if you could leave our viewers and our listeners, well, one piece of advice, it can be personal, it can be business. What would that piece of advice be? That is such a great question. I think that my one piece of advice is to just never stop learning. Your podcast is like a perfect example, right? Like there's so many ways to learn and find information, and especially now, like we have so much access. 
know, back in the day, actually, I had to like go to a library and check out books to find things, you know, <laughs> like there's, and, and I still do that too, because I love books. However, I also love podcasts and the internet and all these other resources that I have. So just, I think there's so much opportunity to keep learning. And that's like, you know, for your career, people are building huge skill sets from online courses and, and learning off YouTube videos, like in our area, in the creative and marketing area, it's amazing, like the skills that people are building around softwares and tools, just self taught, you know, accessing educational opportunities that are just freely available. So you can always learn whatever you're looking for, for your business, for your company. And then I think just always learning something just keeps you fresh. Like you don't get stuck or stale. And, you know, I, I might listen to a podcast about something that it starts and I'm thinking, this is not even something I'm interested in. And then halfway through, I'm like, you know, that night and I'm like telling my husband, did you know, you know, here's my new fun fact about something I'd never even heard of, you know, two hours ago. I just think, um, keeps your perspective fresh and your, you know, your brain active and all that kind of thing. Oh yeah, definitely. There's such a plethora of information out there now that, that you can access. And and a lot of times just for free, um, yeah, you can just yeah. get so much juicy morsels out there now that can, that's, you know, I'm wondering like, you guys are giving away your golden nuggets. I'm sure they have way more platinum nuggets behind that one. <laughs> if, they're, if they're golden nuggets are good, you know, there's even more there. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Christian, as we close out our podcast, um, what is the best way for our viewers and listeners to reach you, to contact you, to learn more from you and have you help them with their recruiting? Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I think the easiest way to, to find our company is our website online, Portfolio Creative dot com and uh, my email is my first name Kristen at portfoliocreative.com so you know we keep it really simple um, there's also a about us page with a link to my you know email people can contact me there or find me on LinkedIn I'm pretty active there too so those are probably the two easiest ways to connect with me I love it I love it and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put Kristen's information in the show notes so you guys are gonna be able to if you're driving right now. Um, so go back to the episode and, and click on her site below. So thank you, Christian, so much for joining us, for sharing your juicy morsels on <laughs> recruiting, recruiting for creatives, recruiting as a small business. We definitely appreciate it. Oh, this has been such a fun conversation. I love talking to you about this stuff. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Kristen.